one of the big themes in the markets this week has been M&As. And Kraft has offered 16 billion bucks for Cadbury. Here in Asia, the Abu Dhabi government has agreed to buy Singapore custom chip maker Chartered Semi for the equivalent of uh, $1.8 billion. Now let's get more on the SemiCon industry. And we are joined today by Stephen Paleo, HSBC's global technology analyst. And he's the number one rated analyst on Chartered Semi. And Steve also happens to cover Taiwan chip makers such as Taiwan Semi and UMC. And his uh, recommendations have generated returns of as much as 40%. Good to have you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, obviously, let's start with the, the news this week on, on Chartered Semi and its uh, purchase by Abu Dhabi. What did you think of this move? I mean, is this a fair price, do you think? Well, let's first stop and think about this for a moment. This is Abu Dhabi state-owned investment company, advanced technology investment company, acquiring Chartered Semiconductor of Singapore. And this follows one of the earlier deals that they did late last October mm -hmm. in that they helped Advanced Micro Devices spin out its own manufacturing facility called Global Foundries into its own foundry. So the deal actually is a follow-on to what they've done before to, to combine the two entities to then compete more effectively against the TSMCs and UMCs of the yeah. world. Is consolidation among the smaller players the theme going forward? It doesn't need to happen in order to compete against those big Taiwan players? See, I would actually consider TSMC, UMC, Chartered are still the bigger players. Uh -huh. There is a long list of smaller players out there, and I, I think further consolidation going forward is not going to be uh, so much on the larger players that you see today, but probably more on some of the smaller ones. If you think about it, it's probably more related to strategic positioning geographically. If you look over the last 20 years, mm -hmm. you've seen semiconductor manufacturing move from the U.S. to Japan, to Korea, to Taiwan, and now China. Yeah. And so I think people really want to get that geographic positioning. In fact, recently, UMC's made an announcement that they'd like to acquire the remaining 85 percent of a China facility that they already have some, some interest in. Okay, so, sorry. I'm going to go back to my first question because I just realized you didn't actually tell me if that uh, pricing was fair from Hobby Dobby. It's if, slippery, Steve. No, no, no. It's <laughs> fine. It's fine. The deal's at roughly about 1.1 times Chartered's reported book value. Right. Now, Chartered's a company that has about two, 2.2 billion in U.S. dollar debt. It's been free cash flow negative nine out of the last 10 years. So some might argue this price is actually more than generous. However, we think the deal makes a lot of strategic sense here. It's extremely complimentary. If you think about it, Global Foundries, that first investment that ATIC made, was struggling with ramping their own capacity, then having to qualify new customers. Mm -hmm. This could have taken two years before we would have known if they could really have any impact on the competitive landscape. By acquiring Charter today, they effectively accelerate that time timeline. Mm -hmm. They get access to capacity, and perhaps more importantly, they get access to Charter's existing customer base. Charter had already had customers like Qualcomm, Broadcom, Infineon, and of course AMD. So strategically, you could argue the combined entity are worth a lot more, and so paying a premium perhaps is justified. Uh, okay, so and this deal you think is pretty much done, or do you think there could be a counter offer coming in from? Oh, I don't know, the likes of TSMC and UMC and other names? Well, the one thing that's a little bit different here is that uh, Singapore state-owned investment council, Tomasic, owns 62 percent of Chartered, and they've already irrevocably pledged their vote in favor of the deal getting done. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's likely that there will be any change here. Mm. And who do you think is next in line to be uh, taken over? I mean, semiconductor manufacturing in China? Hasn't made a profit for a long, long time. Do you think that one of those type of players could be next in terms of uh, being swapped up by someone else? Well, let's, first of all, let's think about it from the overall industry perspective. Consolidation is happening, but it's consolidating to the foundries. So those chip makers that had their own internal manufacturing operations are realizing those are just too expensive. Huh. These are the most expensive factories in the world, four or five billion dollars, to try to design chips and build fabs to build those chips. Very, very uh, extreme cost, costly. Cost, costly there. And so you're going to see increased outsourcing. So consolidation to the foundries is a secular trend. I think that next trend is consolidation more geographically. And so I think we will see some of the smaller players in China, maybe partnerships with them or outright acquisition to try to gain that toehold into a market that has potential to be very large. Mm. Well, Steve, you mentioned uh, how costly it is to make chips these days. What about TSMC and UMC? You know, a lot of people are trying to negotiate down their prices as well, bringing in more competition, maybe going to smaller competitors. But for the likes of TSMC, yeah, it's still a market leader with 50% market share. Is it going to be able to keep that sort of number going? Well, I think from a pricing perspective, it's really a function of the current utilization rate of factories out there. 
Uh, earlier this year, utilization rates fell even below 50% for many companies, and so pricing became much more on the forefront, and I think a lot of discounts were extended to customers. Utilization rates have been ramping very aggressively over the last couple of quarters, with some fabs now fully loaded. So I don't think pricing pressures are something we really need to worry about in the near term. Mm -hmm. I would argue maybe perhaps as this combined entity gets together, maybe if capacity does loosen up, then we'll start to have to worry a little bit more about increasing price pressure. But for now, if anything, I think it's relatively stable, especially as chip makers are now going to the next technology node, which allows you a higher ASP. Then. Yeah, what about, what about TSMC? Uh, is it still the big buy in the sector? Is it the one that jumps up at you? Well, we were fortunate enough to upgrade it last November, mm -hmm. but now the stock's up more than 50% off the yeah. bottom. It's approaching some of the prior peaks in valuation range, and that's really where we struggle. Still a great company, uh -huh. it's just really really on the valuation. We've actually favored UMC. It's relatively much cheaper, great exposure to customers that are aggressively ramping right now. Mm -hmm. And we think it was just a stock that was unjustly punished over the last few years. And we think it's a re-rating story that as they start to execute and prove they're going to prove themselves, they'll go ahead and rebuild some credibility and that valuation will lift. Yeah, well, you know, we were looking at our Bloomberg system and some of the uh, data on TSMC. It's pretty interesting because it, it actually shows that TSMC holds the most cash among the big foundries, uh, you know, equivalent to maybe $4.2 billion that it's accumulated over 10 years. Why doesn't it go out and spend this cash to build its, uh, to build bulk, add more to its uh, capacity? Well, it certainly has scale already. Yeah. And it's certainly because of that scale and that long history, those most expensive factories being fully depreciated, that allows them to earn more profits, keep building that treasure chest of cash. They continue to pay dividends and they've pledged to try to play flat to increasing dividends going forward with that. Mm -hmm. I don't think the scale that you're thinking of in terms of acquiring competitors or what their likely strategy is. Yeah. It's once again trying to uh, acquire those internal operations for chip makers that used to have their own. Maybe not even acquiring the whole factories, but just acquiring their equipment. Finding cheaper ways, if you will, to, uh, uh, I'm just to, to build of capacity. I'm just thinking TSMC trying to fight off the likes of UMC, which, as you say, seems to be catching up. Well, what's going to happen here is with the combination of global foundries and chartered semiconductor, they're still going to be third largest today in terms of capacity, but based on the plans that Global Foundry has in ramping their own CapEx, they'll likely become number two in terms of capacity. Mm -hmm. And Global Foundry's chartered combined is actually number two already in terms of, uh, in terms of the leading edge, 65 nanometer and below technology. Uh -huh. So really those top three, I think, are just going to continue to battle themselves. Uh, and, and, and the goal is to either be on the very leading edge yep. or try to be a fast follower. All right, Steve, let's continue our discussion on UMC after this break. We'll have more with Steve Paleo of HSBC on Chipset after this. So if you have any questions, you can send them along. You know the address. We'll see you after this. Let's uh, get back to our discussion on chips and uh, rejoin Steve Paleo, who is HSBC's technology analyst, and his calls on Chartered Sem. We have uh, reduced uh, re re produced returns of as much as 40% so far. And we were talking about this tie-up of Abu Dhabi and Chartered, and we brought up the, the topic of UMC, which uh, has a smaller market share, about 14% market share, compare that to uh, TSMC, which is still the giant. But wouldn't Chartered's tie-up affect UMC probably the most? You would argue that it's a battle for the second source slot yeah. or the alternative to TSMC. So UMC and the combination of global foundries and chartered are certainly going to be fighting to be there, to be right behind TSMC. I think uh, chip makers today usually go first to TSMC knowing that they have a history of executing very well and they'll be able to get their product to market on time in the volumes that they need. However, from a second source perspective, uh, the net, that's really the next opportunity uh, for UMC and Global Foundries, and that's where we'll probably see a battle. I still believe, though, that it's going to take some time for Global Foundries to qualify mm -hmm. Chartered's customers, to build their own existing capacity. We're probably still a year away before we really start to see some, some, some solid evidence that, yes, they are having an impact. It is interesting to me that if you think about it, this is a consolidation, yet the competitive landscape is actually intensifying. And so it is going to be, as you say, a battle between those, those top three players and maybe the battle between those, the number two and three slot to really try to buy for that second position. Yeah, you have a recommendation on UMC's uh, stock, but we were looking at uh, some of the numbers on the Bloomberg Terminal. Mm -hmm. and. I'm not quite sure on UMC because it has uh, some negative operating margins, according to our data, as well as a negative return 
on equities uh, or equity itself. Is, are those two points of concern for you? Well, certainly the semiconductor industry went through one of the worst and sharpest downturns starting in the third, fourth quarter last year. And yeah. so especially the loss that they took in the first year or the first quarter this year, that's resulting in them having this, this, this negative margin number that you're speaking of. Mm -hmm. However, if you look on a quarter over quarter basis, you certainly see a very strong inflection point. In fact, in the second quarter, you saw them more than double their revenues quarter over quarter. And if you look at the Taiwan monthly sales numbers, for example, that just came out yesterday on UMC, it seems to suggest that UMC's third quarter is actually tracking above their current guidance, which was roughly about 15 percent quarter over quarter revenue growth. Yeah, so what about your target price uh, right now? You're looking at 17 uh, Taiwan dollars for this mm -hmm. stock. Are you thinking maybe upping this forecast, considering you're saying that it seems to be ahead in terms of sales and uh, the positivities? Well, here's the way. We like it because it's a relatively cheaper valuation. It's very easy to make the argument based on valuation. Our price target of 17 is just based on 1.2 times book value. Mm -hmm. This is a stock that really didn't trade much below 1.3 times book value prior to 2003. This is, or part, pardon me, prior to 2008. This is what I was talking about, the stock being unjustly penalized, we believe. And so you can make an argument that perhaps just to get back to that kind of 1.3 times still presents us with maybe another 10 to 20 percent upside mm -hmm. before we then have to start saying to ourselves, is this a company that is better cycle to cycle? And it would appear with them being much more uh, focused on their own margins, focused lower capital intensity going forward, this is setting up for them to actually uh, be a better company cycle to cycle and then perhaps uh, justify an even higher valuation multiple before. In comparison, you've got a company like TSMC trading at 3.7 times book. So 1.1 today versus 3.7, I agree TSMC is a much, much better company, but perhaps that, 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 that split is a little too wide in my mm. opinion. Okay, Steve. Well, thank you for dropping by today. Sure, uh, Steve Filet of HSBC, and we should uh, mention to our audience, we did some, get some questions on the DRAM chip makers, but you only focus uh, on the foundries at least. So thank you for that. Steve Filet of HSBC.